talking to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get going. All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Sex and Suicide podcast. We are working with the Mental Health and Motivational Monday. So thank you for tuning in. With us this evening, we have a good friend of mine and also a very inspirational young gentleman by the name of Matt Ranger. Matt, how you doing? Good, man. How are you? I'm good. And as always, we have our co-host, Mr. Vinny Chase. Hello. That's it? Hello. Vinny Chase, <laughs> Chase, be honest. Are you stoned right now? <laughs> a little. A little? Okay. All right. So Vinny Chase is stoned on Mental Health Monday. Good start. We're, we're kicking here. I'm just kidding. No judgment here, buddy. It's all good. <laughs> so, um, Matt, how you doing, big guy? Good, man. How are you? Good. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen you. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. So, what uh, what brings you here today? What's I'm that? here. I'm here to talk about some stuff with you, Sean. We got like lots of stuff, man. We There's do so much stuff. We do. And just to be clear, um, Vinny Chase doesn't know your story, right? From yeah. when you were. And and I want to start off by sort of introducing everyone to how how much volunteer sort of work you've done in the past and how that came to be. Um, I know it was a while ago, but I don't think enough people know about just how much you've accomplished. And I know you don't like to talk about it because you're a pretty humble guy, mm-hmm. but it's it's a very inspirational tale and something that you did at a, at a really young age, which not a lot of kids your age were even thinking about. They were too self-absorbed at the time to be doing what you were doing. So yeah. um, why don't you tell me what uh, what got you going and how you sort of started your volunteer work? So growing up, uh, mom was a PSW, so a personal support worker, okay. and um, she had a client uh, named Glenn Elford, yeah. and he was, uh, she would do home visits with him, just like a regular, you know, just a regular client, um, but became close with, with his wife. Okay. And, uh, and then, you know, as time went on, we went over and we were visiting, um, I'd bring my homework over and just sit in the, in the dining room and do my homework sure. while mom was doing her thing. Um, and uh, Glenn had Parkinson's disease. So, so this, was, this was the gentleman she was taking care of? Yeah. Okay. So I would have been like, oh man, 12? Okay. 12, 13? Yeah. Um, so I'd be sitting there in the dining room doing my homework and I'd look over and I'd see Glenn and he would be shaking and, you know, at 12 years old, I'm like, why is that? What's going on, right? Sure. Yeah. It's probably, you know, pretty shocking for a 12 year old to see something like that. Yeah, and he wasn't really like he did. He wouldn't talk or anything like that. He just kind of sat there. So, you know, I'd get home and be like, "Mom, what, well, what's going on with like Glenn? What, some wrong? Like, some wrong? Like what? Right? What's going on?" So, so you didn't know at all. That I had no clue. Anything wrong with him at the time? You didn't no know. No idea. So you you just thought your mom was visiting a friend? I knew that it was a client. Okay. But we became kind of close with the wife, with his with Glenn's wife. Yeah. So we would go over there every now and then to do homework and just kind of visit with mom. Sure. Um, so that's how we. We got to know them so um, leaving there obviously i'd have questions for mom like what what's going on right right yeah and she she was trying to like educate me in the most simplest way about what was going on with glenn okay um so i was like 12 13 at that time and then so she explained everything about glenn so glenn had parkinson's disease yeah and at that time i I obviously had no idea about it um right and I was like, I had an upcoming, upcoming school project that I had to do. Yeah. And I was like, this is perfect. I'm going to dive in here and sure. just kind of see, you know, what, what Parkinson's is all about. And, um, and it kind of took off from there, man. Yeah. I just went from there. So what, what is it that uh, when you did the Parkinson's project, you were still, this was around the age of 12. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what happened between doing that project and uh, sort of the traumatic event that you experienced that led to your volunteer work? So obviously during my, like making the project, I was, I was doing some research. Sure. And at that point, nobody really was, was making Parkinson's, you know, a, a big deal. Like right. It wasn't talked about much. Okay. Um, there was a lot of cancer and, and multiple sclerosis and stuff like that. The big walks, like Terry yeah. Fox run and stuff like that. Did, uh, did Michael J. Fox have it at that time? Was that known or? Yeah, he would have had it, but it would have been like, Behind the curtains a little bit. He sure. Hadn't even come sure. Out. He wasn't. Yeah. Okay. He wasn't so, very public about it at that point. Right. Okay. Um, so, anyways, during my research, I found out more about it, and I was like, "This is kind of interesting." And people should know about this, right? Yeah. Um, so, after my project, I was like, "I feel like I need to do something." No one's doing anything um, for Parkinson specifically, and I was like, I'm, "I grew up playing hockey. Like, I'm gonna throw on the blades and just roll the blade around and see if I can create some noise." 
um, about awareness for Parkinson's. And so how old were you this time? 14. 14. So just going into high school. Okay, just going into high school. So you're a grade 9 student mm -hmm. and uh, you had no other reason for, for doing this other than the fact that his death really upset you. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think it was more of the fact like I didn't completely understand why you sure, know what I mean? Sure. Um, and it's a it's such a such a visible thing too. Yeah. Um, you know, it was just uh, one of those things that kind of got to me a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then I just kind of thought, I want to do something. We all have so much power. Like we're right. we're able to do so many things, and and I wanted to you know just draw so much attention to it. Okay. So what did you do? So I like I said, growing up playing hockey. Yeah. Uh, people did bikes across Canada. It started in Canada wide. Like I wanted to rollerblade across Canada. Okay. But I, my mom's like, let's slow down a little bit here. Like <laughs> let's start sure. small <laughs> and try to like plan it out a little bit, right? Yeah. So you're an ambitious kid. Yeah. So um, I, I said, look to Ontario. So we started in London, and then I was like, hey, well, I want to do something a little bit bigger, like a little yeah. bit more challenging. So um, uh, we, we said, let's do Ontario. So we started to Mori. Um, I sat down with like, the Parkinson Society of Southwestern Ontario. Yeah. I met the gentleman who uh, helped organize Jesse Davidson's uh, stuff. Yep. Um, and I still, in the back of my head, I was like, I still want to do Canada. Like, Ontario, no one's going to see me in Ontario, right? <laughs> right, sure. And uh, so anyways, they were like, no, Matt, let's start start small, man. Like, let's start something that we can do locally and then build up from there. Yep. Um, so yeah, we started in Tobamori and uh, it took about 12 days. Okay. Uh, I wasn't rollerblading every day, of course, but uh, 12 days and it was about 600 kilometers. Okay. So, so did you go from, where did you go? You started in Tobamori and went to where? To London? So we went basically down Highway 21. So okay. from Tobamori, um, through Mar, all up north, um, yeah. and then all the way down Highway 21 to Godridge, down to like Windsor area. Oh wow. And then back through Sarnia. Yeah. And then back up to London. So you did kind of a, a loop. Yeah. Way. Yeah. Okay. Maybe kind of a hook. A, a hook, yeah. yeah that's yeah. kind of a description. <laughs> All right, just like Main Chase's penis. <laughs> but, <laughs> really? Just kidding. We're not going to go there. But anyway, good for you, bud. Yeah. So, what was the end result? I mean, did you accomplish everything that you wanted to accomplish? So, yeah, kind of. Yeah. Um, so, it still felt like I didn't do, um, you know, the things I, I kind of set out to do in a sense. Like I did create awareness. And the crazy thing is, like back then, there was no like Twitter and, and no, social media, sure. right? So. Yeah. Literally, you, you mean you didn't have these following? No, <laughs> like, there's no such thing, man. It's crazy. It yeah. seems like not too long ago, but it's long enough, right? But yeah. uh, we had, we went to CAA to plan out like a roadmap, and they printed us off like a, a road map, and that's how we travel. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So, so how did you end up generating publicity and in, in the noise that you created? Um, I, I assume it was picked up by the news. It was, yeah, and, like. Like a lot of that was from me. Like I would just pick up the phone and, and call, call anybody. Sure. I called uh, Enterprise Daily Rental. They gave us a car for the trip. Um, I called like every radio station. Uh, New PL. I think it's called New PL. You're, right you're a 14 year old fucking kid. Yeah, I was just yeah. Yeah, phone calling anybody because that's really yeah. back then. That's the only way you could really get sure. anybody, right? So yeah. Or e I think email was just come like kind of around, but. Yeah. Well, it makes sense that you eventually went into car sales because you're used to calling these people. Yeah. I mean, you started out at a young age, yeah. you know, with a great cause, but did you get any rejection? Not really. No. Everybody was fairly on board with it? You know what? When we went through Godridge, like busy, Grand Bend, sorry, it wasn't Godridge. Yeah. It was like, it was busier because we did it uh, through the summer. People were kind of ignorant, like honking on horns, like, get out of the way, but... <laughs> well, I feel like like they didn't know what was going on. But it was just blocking traffic. Yeah, you know, like what a kilometer deep. Yeah. yeah, that's summer. It was summertime. It was summertime. Yeah. yeah so yeah, everyone was just was old. Yeah, sure. But like, back I, then, Grand Bend was fucking wild too. Yeah. Because I had a cottage out there, right? So yeah. at no, that some, time, some yeah. cars man would zip by us at like a hundred, just flying by. Did like, you, were you close to getting hit ever? A couple times. Yeah. Really? Yeah. We and then the car was marked, right? But. No, people, some people just didn't really no. you know, care or whatever. I wonder how many drunk drivers passed you at that time. Probably, probably, <laughs> probably yeah. a few. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so you, you finished your tour across Ontario, and you're 14 years old, and did, did you raise, do you know how much money you raised for Parkinson's? It was, it was into like a couple thousand, couple thousand dollars, like just over two thousand bucks. Sure, which is But that was like forever. just cash through the window of, of the car, right? Right. Like, I was rollerblading and people would just like run up. There was actually a really cool story of this. This, uh, we were driving, we were coming through like Tobamori area, 
and new PL had sent out like a, a live uh, news thing saying that Matt's coming through yeah. this area. Yeah. So this little girl came out to the road. Yeah. And like in the middle of nowhere. Okay. And uh, she came out to the road and she was like waving at me. And I was like, this is real. I'm gonna stop. Like, sure. This is cool, man. Yeah. And so I stopped and I was talking to her. It ended up leading into that her grandpa had Parkinson's. But this little girl, like I think she was like six or seven, yeah, understood what I was doing. So it was really cool. No kidding. Um, I stopped and, and she's like, "Hold on, hold on." So she ran down this down her driveway back to mom yeah. and grabbed some money, like whatever they had to give to us. That's cute. It was kind of cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? See that sure. the impact. Well, she. I mean, such an age, she was half the age you were, and you didn't understand the ticks yeah. and everything. Yeah. I mean, I guess she got what we were doing, but she didn't really probably fully understand the disease. No, she just wanted to help out grandpa probably. Right, yeah. sure. Yeah. So you've done the tour across Ontario to raise Parkinson's awareness at 14 years old. Then what did you do after that? So I took a couple years off okay. and I was like, I want to focus on school and stuff sure. like that. Yeah, yeah as <laughs> most kids are doing at that <laughs> yeah. time, right? And uh, obviously volunteer with the Parkinson Society like here and there. Mm -hmm. And then I, I got this like light bulb and I was like, I need to do something again. Like I'm not fulfilled, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm missing, I'm still missing something. So I was like growing up, I always wanted to set a world record. Yeah. I thought how cool would it be to hold a world record? Right? Sure. So I was like, maybe I can tie in that with you know, a little bit of the Parkinson's thing. So you got the itch to kind of give back again. You spent two years kind of focusing on you, as most kids do at that age. Yeah. And then something kind of stirred within you, and you felt like, hey, I want to do something again to yeah, it help. Yeah, it wasn't done. Yeah, you done. No, it wasn't over. Are you done now? Are you? Th no, I. I, I, I always. Still, I kind of miss it. You like, do yet? Yeah, but I, I feel like I still do my part every day to I to give back, right? One hundred percent. And uh, I continue on with that, and that kind of fulfills me. And I'm a busy. I'm busy. You know, you grow up, you have you have life, right? We'll get it's to tough, that. But. We'll get to that. But let's continue with. Um, okay, you wanted to break this Guinness Book of World Records. So mm -hmm. what did you end up doing? So I emailed Guinness. And the, I said, this is kind of what I want to do. I want to set, I think initially, I just wanted to set a record on rollerblades. Didn't know, you know, whether before it was backwards or whatever the case may be. Right. I said, what records do you have that I can put, you know, record and rollerblades together and, and set something? Yeah. And they sent me back a couple. I can't remember exactly all of them, um, but one of them was backwards. Okay. And it was the longest distance traveled backwards in 24 hours. And I was like, man, I don't know if I could do that. Yeah. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a shot. Yeah. So I emailed them back, and I'm like, I'm, I'm doing it. What, are, like, what do I have to do? And uh, they sent me a whole bunch of guidelines so as to what I had to do to follow it to make sure that it was legit. Yeah. And um, honestly, like after that, I was like, man, this is amazing. And so I just ran with it again, and I started training. But I, I couldn't, you can't really train for backwards skating, you know right. what I mean? So what did you do to train for backwards skating? I went to like, I would go to like Spring Bank and just roll over, like people would look at me like, what is this, <laughs> yeah. what is this <laughs> doing? <laughs> so I, I, I kind of did it on, like my own, on my own street because I was like, these people, don't get it was it. almost a good way to like hype it up a little bit because people, are, you know, eventually would see that on the news and stuff, right? Sure. But I was rolling backwards and this guy's looking at me like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> right. But anyways, so. Um, yeah, so I had to do it. I had to do 200 kilometers um, within 24 hours. 200 kilometers in 24 hours, 24 hours, skating backwards. Yeah. So where did you do this whole? I mean, obviously you couldn't do a ton of prep work for it. You didn't really know how to train for it. So tell me what that day was like. Did, what time did you start at, and where did you do this? So it was at Delaware Speedway. Yeah. Because I was thinking of doing it on the street, but like it wouldn't be safe at all. You know what I mean? <laughs> No, probably like potholes and stuff all over the place. I take a spill hard. Yeah, you'd smack your head a few times. Yeah, I'm sure. So I was like, you know, growing up, we would always go out to Delaware Speedway and watch races and stuff. So I was like, I'm gonna contact these guys and tell them what I'm doing. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, like come out. We'll give you the key to the track, and you just kind of do your thing. They were really good. And um, yeah, so we, we started at like 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, so you started around noon. Yeah. And you started. So that was the starting point. Of 24 hours, so yeah. you're going from noon to midnight back to noon again. Yeah. Okay. What day was this? Oh, man, I, Do you uh, remember if it was like a weekend or? I think it was like Thursday. Really? Yeah. And in the summertime? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you're off school. Yeah. Um, you, didn't, you didn't even try to get out of school to do something. Like that. No. <laughs> I know. What a guy. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, okay. So you, you start at noon 
and you start skating backwards. What was going through your mind? I was like, I'm not gonna be able to do this. Honestly, like that's. Yeah. I was like, this is crazy. Yeah, I did it like is. two laps. Okay. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I still have 198 laps to go. Oh, right. Like shit. God. And I was like, oh my god. Like, How I didn't really think this through, right? Like, <laughs> no, I I was so. scared across Canada. It's, <laughs> it's a weird thing to do, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I think sure. that's why it's so cool, though. Yeah. So, so you you're you're on your second lap, and you're yeah. thinking, shit, I still have 198 <laughs> fucking <laughs> laps to do. Yeah. So what did what did you do? Obviously, you went through with it, but honestly, man, it was like it was the support of like family and friends that came out, and the biggest motivation for me was uh, Marilyn Elford, so the gentleman that I did all this for. His wife came out, right, and and then people with Parkinson started to come out. So I was like, oh man, like I'm making a pretty big impact. Yeah. Right? Um, so that kind of kept me going. The toughest part was getting into like the nighttime. Yeah. It's colder. Uh, and Delaware Speedway's outside, right? Yeah. So okay. they, they'd have the light, like the lights on and stuff like that. Sure. But uh, was there a time where you completely alone ever? No. 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 <laughs> people just leave out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you're left skating around right. the ring. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, my brother was there, and the funny thing is that Delaware Speedway gave him a golf cart, so he would like follow me in a golf cart, laughing at me like, yeah, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm skiing backwards, right? No so, kidding. That was cool. Yeah. So 24 hours. What did it feel like when you finished? I mean, yeah. Did did was there a point where you just like? you know, numbed yourself out and your, your brain just kind of stopped? How did... I remember vividly, it was lap like 175. Okay. And it Only was... 175? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I got the pace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, so, yeah, go on. No, go for it, man. I, I, You're going to ask me how long it takes to go around around the track. Well, no, I was just thinking like, like after you got done, was it like a shock? trying to walk forward <laughs> it was like, weird oh yeah i bet that would have been like something yeah else. what was the feeling i like? constantly felt like i was going back <laughs> yeah i constantly felt like i was going backwards right? when you were walking forward after that yeah time? When, when i was done like i lie down for like a solid 20 25 minutes <laughs> right and you're exhausted right because I, I didn't sleep or anything like i felt no. yeah. and almost i barely stopped because i found that if you stopped you wouldn't want to get back up and going. Of course. Right? Did you eat in between? Yeah, I eat snacks and stuff, but like that. Really? But that. Like, so when you're skiing back, <laughs> it's like you just pound it back. Like you know? No. no, no <laughs> How I, does that work? I take like short breaks, but like, you know, like right. Nutrient bars and little sandwich here and there. But I, I, the, the longer I stopped, the less I was like wanting to keep going. Sure. Right? You just want to keep the momentum. Yeah, yeah. So what happened around 175? We kind of started there. So 175 was like, li like it only. It's only a little bit left. Yeah. But it seems like that Forever. it's the most left, right? And during the night, man, like you're it's mind over matter. Mm -hmm. Like it you lose you lose the physical stuff. Like it's not about muscle and training at that point. No. Your brain's just telling you to like, dude, enough's enough. <laughs> sure. <laughs> We're yeah. over, right? But um no, I I powered through, man. But after Fuck. after I, I honestly collapsed, man. I was just yeah. exhausted. How long did it take you to recover from that? Because you're sleep deprived, you're muscle you're fatigued, you're you obviously didn't eat properly, yeah. you probably were dehydrated. Yeah. How long did it take you to recover from this? I remember the day the day that day when I finished. The day. <laughs> yeah, the day. It was the day. Yeah. Uh, on the ride home I passed out. I don't even remember leaving the track. Really? I, I just remember waking up at home in my bed. Like it was just ah. exhausted. I, and I love that it was, so it was 200 kilometers. 202 kilometers. 202. Yeah. So you know that if they gave you 202 kilometers, there's some poor fucker out there who's got 201 kilometers. Yeah. Who's just like, you <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> does, does that record still stand? I don't know. Honestly, I haven't yeah. looked into it. You haven't looked into it? Um, what if someone beat that record? Would you that'd consider... be the coolest thing ever, man. I'd love to meet that guy. Would you? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Or would you consider if it was, what if he only did 203 kilometers? Would you try to go for that 204? I don't know if I'd ever do that again. <laughs> Yeah. I don't That's know why crazy. you did it in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Just going for one extra kilometer and not like 20 or 30. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I might give it a shot. Yeah. Probably not. No. <laughs> but like, after you've done something like that, you probably feel like you could accomplish almost anything. To you yeah, know? I know, I mean, for sure. Was high school a breeze then? or like I, yeah. I don't even know. Like, I can't just, <laughs> man, I have, a, I have a tough time staying up for like the yeah, full, you know, 18 hours a day, 16 <laughs> hours. So to stay up for 24 while yeah. you're rollerblading backwards, <laughs> yes. oh my god. Yeah, no, no, you, you definitely, after that, man, like you feel like you're on top of the world. Like you can literally do everything, anything, right? Right. Um, and obviously looking back at like the 12-day Ontario thing, I was like, that 
That was easy. That's a joke. I could have done. I could have done Canada. For sure. sure. But so, do you think that's in the cards ever? Do you think that you might pull that one on your trousers one day? I don't know, man. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Speaking of pulling something on your trousers, you've got a, a uh, baby on the way. Yeah, man. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so, let's go back in time here. You, you're you're 16 years old when you complete this. When I completed uh, the, the record. Yeah. No, I was like 17. 17 when yeah, you broke the record. Crazy. So Matt Bringer at one point held. We should look into that. We should really. Yeah, I yeah. wish we had a computer. I know. Here, but so you held you held the record. Oh, you do have a fucking computer, but that's <laughs> really easy to turn around. So um, you broke the record, and we don't know if that still stands. And then I set the record, man. I didn't break it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, set no, the record. Yeah, I just want to make sure. Okay, make sure that <laughs> yeah. that's on the table. Yeah. This humble guy speaks up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So um, let's fast forward to the time when when I met you because obviously you were working at Lexus at that time, mm-hmm. and I was buying a car from you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I noticed that article, and that was something I was like, wow, you know, this guy's really got a big heart. So when you finished that, did you continually like has Parkinson's been um, a part of your life, sort of volunteering or dedicating some time to that society? Is that stuck with you? Yeah, for sure. Like I, I everything, every event they organize, uh, I try to get involved. Sure. To the best I can. But, yeah. Uh, uh, I got Lexus involved with some sponsorship stuff at wow. work, and and they kind of let me lead on anything that uh, that Parkinson's was doing. So Very I try cool. I try to keep in touch and lend a hand when I can. Right. Very cool. So. And when you and I met, you and Robin, your now wife, mm-hmm. how long have you been dating by the time you, when we first met? Because I know I was in a model home working for a builder selling real estate. And you guys were looking for a house. Yeah, that would have been like ten years. Ten together. years you were together? We were together, yeah. So when did you guys start dating? Like when we were 14, like high school. Holy school. shit. Yeah. So she was with you through... Like everything. The, really? Yeah. So she was with you through the Ontario yeah. and the breaking of the record? Yeah. Both, man. Did you get a... Kind of cool. Did she get turned on by all this? <laughs> yeah, I <hope> so. yeah. <laughs> You're like a fucking hero, man. Yeah. Who would yeah. That's amazing. So, okay. Um, and then when we met, you were looking for a house, and now you're married. So what kind of happened in that time period and then you were working as a sales uh like a salesperson for car salesman mm-hmm. for lexus and now you are in police foundation to fan shop so mm-hmm. what 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 was the shifting point there you know what it wasn't you know i go like i always look back and every everything um i ever wanted to do had something to do with policing okay and uh i i, I mean like when you know always like trying to give back and, and trying to make a difference right and um that was kind of always in my heart and, and kind of always what i wanted to do um but you know you kind of grow up and you need some money and you want to you want to party and have fun and sure. you know buy things right yeah and uh so I, I got into car sales at 18 yeah and 18 19 and um i just kind of i liked it and i didn't know anything about it like, right. I, like I think right. it was an add-on in London Free Press, and I just applied. Yeah. And uh, literally had nothing, like, I knew nothing about cars. So, yeah. and that thing drove, and they kind of, you know, there's nice ones and bad ones. Did but, you start uh, with Lexus? No, I started with Kia. Okay. And um, I was with them for like three years. And literally, it was just a job. I just needed a job, and I just applied. And it did well. Mm-hmm. And I think I liked the, the customer service aspect of it, like yeah. talking to people and meeting people. Yeah. Um, and then. It just wasn't wasn't doing it for me, so uh, you know I moved in. I was doing well, but I wanted more volume, and I mm-hmm. looked over to uh, Toyota. Because I mean, Toyota, Honda, they're pretty well known brands. Sure. So, yep. um, and moved over there. Spent two years with Toyota sales, and then I was the Scion brand manager. So uh, Toyota, the family is Lexus, Toyota. Yeah. They released the Scion brand to a younger generation. Yeah. Uh, so I took on that. And then was uh, brought over to the Lexus side and mm-hmm. spent two years there. So, right on. Yeah. How many How many cars has my family bought off you? I sold your dad a car. Yeah. And then there was a frustration. There was another car that he bought out of frustration. Out of frustration, uh, he bought yeah, a car. I remember this, he had the Scion. Oh yeah. And the Corolla. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, there was an incident. I there was a little incident. Yeah. yeah. Was that the one with uh, my sister? I think so. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. Um, Anyway, that was because she didn't feel comfortable driving stand so yeah. another car had to be purchased. <laughs> yeah. That's a long story in itself. But anyway, um, okay. So after the whole Lexus uh, transition, 
you 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 you're now working where? So I work security um, downtown. Where and, whereabouts? Uh, Market Tower. Okay, so how's that? At Wellington and or Jeez. Richmond and Dundas. Yeah. So so you're familiar with the Market yeah, Tower? Yeah, absolutely. Right? What's up down there? Down near Dundas, right? Yeah. 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 It's, it's in Richmond. Right? Dundas, Richmond. Richmond. Yeah. yeah. That's a rough area. Yeah. So what what happens on that corner? Like, what do you have to deal with? Lots of things, man. Like it's it's kind of. It's kind of interesting because you never know what you're walking into, right? Right. But it's such a diverse crowd down there. But I love hearing your stories about sort of the, the characters that you deal with. So yeah. can you tell us about some of the situations you've been through? Oh, man, like there's been so many times. And, and it, it, it kind of goes from drug-related issues to like mental health. Right. right. A lot of a lot of the times it is mental health. Related, sure. Right. Which ties in with the podcast we're doing tonight. Yeah. So how do you decipher between someone that's fucked up on crystal meth versus someone that's just dealing with a mental illness. Well, I've been down, so we see the regulars, we call them the regulars, they hang around, hang around there. Sure. We know all them. Right. And we, after a year spent down there, I can pick up like the differences between those specific people, sure. whether they're on something or they're just having a bad day. Which let's face it, even if they are drug users, there's probably a, a good chance that there's a mental illness probably. underlying that. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, everybody kind of uses drugs as uh, an escape to some extent um, from whatever that is, and sometimes they take over. But uh, that escape could be something like anxiety, depression that you're feeling, um, mm-hmm. and, and so on and so forth. So when you're at that corner, what are some... I mean, you, you show me pictures of, like... But I don't think people in London realize some of the drugs that are going around here. Maybe they do, but like that corner specifically has a lot of drug trafficking, does it not? It does, yeah. So and it's not even like hidden; like it's out there. Yeah, yeah. You, you can only like if you yeah. spend five minutes down there. Yeah, you yeah. could watch three or four drug deals yeah. happen. What yeah. do you think is the drug of choice that's being traded on that corner? Uh, crystal meth. Crystal meth is the it's big a huge thing. problem. Yeah. 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 And, and you're in police foundations now as well. Mm-hmm. So do you talk, I'm sure you guys talk about the drug um, epidemic that's kind of been happening. Yeah. And, uh, and and you and I have talked about how in police foundations now, they're focusing a lot on, on mental health as well because officers, I mean, I know that sometimes when you're dealing with, from the volunteer work that I've done, it's really tough to listen to someone that's maybe schizophrenic or bipolar. If you don't know that they're, they're coping with something, you just think this guy's fucked up. and. You, you kind of act, you can act aggressively yeah. toward that individual. So are they training you now to better approach people? Is that kind of part of the schooling? I think the, the biggest problem is that we don't treat those people as people. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Like we treat them as the lowest of, of the low. Right. But what I find interesting about that job and that location and the people that I deal with is they're people, man. Like yeah. those, they all have a story, right? That's someone's kid. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So I, I find it interesting in talking to these people down there, whether they're on something or not. So what are the, some of the stories that you've heard that have touched you? I've heard stories from like, you know, I was successful at one point, um, you know, mom and dad split, um, and then I kind of just lost myself. So divorce yeah. could have been a factor in sure. Them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then they just got caught into the wrong crowd because there was no father figure or, or mom around, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then they just kind of lose it all and, and get caught in with the wrong drug like crystal meth. Yeah. And then there's no, it's hard to come out of that. Like we, we look at it as those people, oh, they're just a waste and, um, you know, they, it's easy to get a job and stuff like that. Sure. It's not. Like yeah. some, sometimes those people legit can't get a job right? Right. because of the state they're in. Sure. And um, we're blind to that, I feel like, mm-hmm. as society, right? I think that people are becoming more aware. I think that, uh, you know, this is what we're trying to do here. And I think a lot of the time, people that end up on that corner, probably at one point in time felt like they didn't fit in anywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's the purpose of this, is if you guys are watching and you feel like you don't fit in, you fit in here. I mean, we're we're here to hear your story. You can do sort of what Vinny Chase does. You can kind of have an an anonymous sort of personality, I guess, really. Could it treat you <laughs> yeah, you can, you can be the hood, but as long as you have a story to share, we're here to listen, and I think that's that's important because we don't want people to end up on that corner looking for that wrong crowd yeah. that might accept them at that time. For sure. So, um, let's get back to you now. So, you um, you recently, you're in police foundations, you're working as a security guard uh, on a really dangerous corner mm-hmm. where you're seeing needles and things like that on a regular basis. Um, and then 
you, you're doing so well in school that they actually took you to Miami? Mm-hmm. So yeah, tell us so about that. The Fanshawe program, this is kind of a cool story. My yeah. brother went on that same trip. So you and your brother, but you have to be top of the class, right? You do, yeah. So you and your brother are both have both been top students of Fanshawe and the Police Foundation program. Yeah. That's fucking cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. And uh, the cool thing is, too, is that he went with the same teacher that I, I went with. So we kind of exchanged stories and stuff. Right. And that uh, was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they take the top students who so you interview for it, and uh, they fly you, well, you pay for it. Okay, like, hey, yeah, no, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sure. But they take you down to Miami, yeah. and you get to, you know, do ride-alongs with some police agencies down there, and um, visit a medical examiner, like you, which you wouldn't be able to do here. Right. Um, so and, did you see any crazy shit? Not really, man. Like, I heard a couple, like, crazy calls come in. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't go any, into anything that was pretty crazy, but... No. It's a different mentality down there. So would you say that they're behind in um, the, sort of the treatment of that you're talking about of people that might be mentally ill or um, on drugs? Would you say that they still are behind the times approaching them in all the ways that you feel? Like, okay. how do you feel? I, I, think they're, I think they're up. Like, the guys that I got to be a, like, be a part of this and, and go on ride-alongs with, those guys were up to speed. Okay. And, and like, we had to go to a, a call where this guy was... Uh, acting up outside of a Walgreens and um, he like obviously mental health really yeah good. sure and uh, they dealt with it the similar way that he probably smoked way too much weed you hear that Vinny Chase <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah they dealt with it as like as if I would you know the same way I would deal with it so okay they're very same same mentality in that regard yeah um, just their their gun balance is like off the charts right yeah. yeah yeah so that's another thing that you just have to watch out for I guess yeah um, well, I think that it's great that you're doing this because we're lucky to have someone that's so aware of the potential for people to be mentally ill. I think that in this world, it's almost, at this point in time, better to approach everyone as if there's something, because everyone's got their own shit, right? And I've said it before, I don't think anyone's mentally, fully mentally healthy. But I think that at that point in time, someone could be just that close from going off the edge. So if you approach them as though, hey, there might be something wrong, rather than what the fuck's wrong with that guy. Right. It's a better way to live, it's a better way for everyone, I think. Yeah. Everyone's so quick to walk by someone on the street, right? You're holding up a sign that says money, you need, right. need, need food, or whatever the case may be. But uh, I'm the type of guy that would stop and be like, hey man, like, hey, what's your story? Yeah, you know, sure. You know, I'm curious as to how you got there. Yeah. Well, especially like some of, you know, there's some really, there's, there's some older gentlemen you know, that are out there on the streets that have, Thanks, for a while. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I'm just are saying. You, are you trying to say that there's some regulars kind of? There's some see? older guys, like you know, they're, they're in London. Yeah, you're regulars, but they're yeah. usually older men, right? And so going along with stories and whatnot, yeah. you wonder like, wow, I wonder what that guy's going to say. Sure. I wonder what his story is, right? Yeah, I no, I think that everybody gets so preoccupied in the mentality of go, 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 okay. um, and next task, next, next. You know what I mean? Instead of just being absorbed in the moment and really thinking yeah. about what that person went through. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, what the fuck do I have to do next? And I'm more, you know, this guy's going to slow me down. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, yeah, there definitely needs to be a mindset shift in, in, in that regard, for sure. Um, so, you've been, you just got married last year. Is it, has it been a year yet? Almost. Almost. Yeah. When? July. July. Okay. I almost forgot. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully <laughs> Robin's she's passed out. Bed, yeah, she's in bed. <laughs> okay. So, um, how has the first year of marriage been? It's good, man. I mean, obviously, we've been together for so long. Right. Um, not, nothing's really changed. Sure. And I feel like that's the way, you know, you kind of want it. Other than the fact that you, right? knocked your, you knocked her out. <laughs> that's a little <laughs> bit of a difference, right? Yeah. So, were you guys waiting for to, to be married, and then you're just like, okay, if it happens, it happens? Yeah, I think, like, we all, you know, we wanted to get married first, and she's European, right? So, traditionally... They sure. want to get married or marry first and have kids. So yeah, we, I think we kind of planned it that way, man. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So was was Robin pregnant well you before the wedding or after the wedding? No. Okay, because yeah, I know that yeah. some people in yeah, European yeah. culture too they'll be like, oh get shit, it, get it done. I'm pregnant. We got to get married, right? <laughs> no, no, it was I, after. It's not just European culture, but in a lot of cultures for sure. Right? Yeah. So yeah, so because it was very quick after the wedding, wasn't it? Yeah. Do you think that the conception happened? No, no. no over sure. over the honeymoon. Conception. Yeah, I said that right, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so over the honeymoon, do you think that? No, I don't know. Afterwards? It was definitely after, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What position were you in? <laughs> no, I just <laughs> <kidding>. <laughs> I had, you I had yeah. yeah. 
I, I know I said I'd stay away from the, the sexual <laughs> stuff there, but um, has, has your sex life, like just honestly, openly, I think that um, people would be curious when you, when your wife becomes pregnant or, or after marriage, was there any kind of shift in your sex life? Not really, man. It no. kind of stayed consistent? Yeah. Are you ever, are you one of those guys that's nervous about like, you know, hurting the baby? Kind of. <laughs> kind of. It is weird, right? Yeah. yeah. But sure. It's, it's all good, man. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, he doesn't want to get down this road. <laughs> yeah. He's like, my wife is going to kill me if I go too deep. <laughs> well, you kind of did. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I wish you nothing but the best yeah, sure. with, with obviously your marriage and with, do you know the sex? Girl. Ah, oh, oh, awesome, man. I got one of those. Yeah, They're yeah. the best. Have you thought about names? Yeah, a couple. What are you thinking? I'm not, uh, oh, you're not going to go there. No, you're, not, <laughs> no. you're going to keep that. No, okay. there's a couple. Of, we we have. Uh, we're going to go there. Casey is okay. one, uh, and Peyton. I like those both. Yeah. yeah, I like Peyton. It's hard, man. Yeah, it is hard. We wanted two solid ones just in case. You know, when it when it's when she's born, sure. you're like, ah, oh, it's not Casey. And then you have to have a backup. Yeah, it's funny because we were just talking with this downstairs, <laughs> and I was saying, you know, I have a daughter named Natalia. But uh, the next daughter that I had, I thought, you know, I, I like to name her Shayla. That's kind of the name that I like. Yeah. And Vinny Chase, I oh, never name my daughter Shayla. All <laughs> right. So we kind of went through this. So Vinny Chase, <laughs> what is your your firstborn daughter's name going to be? Not Shayla. Not Shayla. All right. Well, I'd, I'd name her not Shayla before I named her Shayla. <laughs> <laughs> what about a boy? Yeah. What about a boy? <laughs> boy. Oh God, I haven't. I honestly haven't even thought. What about Vinny Chase Jr.? Vinny Chase Jr., yeah. VCJ, or just VJ. Then, yeah. Rhymes with BJ, it's a good thing. Yeah. Okay, um, so Matt, you are my business partner yeah. for Final Rose Entertainment. So for those of you that don't know, Matt and I are, um, we have a, a DJ entertainment company, mainly for weddings and uh, events. But um, the reason I chose to go with Matt is because we wanted to do something that was kind of a passion project that gives back. So with every event that we do, we give a portion of our profits to CMHA, which is Canadian Mental Health Association. Um, so are you enjoying the business that we run? Yeah, man, it's fun. Yeah. I feel like, you know, with music, it's so powerful too, right? Like, sure. Um, you know, we, you need music for everything, yeah. really. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, no, I enjoy it. It's a good time. Yeah, you're, well, you're, I've done some events with you, obviously, at this point. Um, we did the Parkinson's Walk. We did uh, a few other events, um, one at the Ladies' Night Out at Mercedes. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you, you're very natural on the microphone. You do, you do a good job. So I have total confidence in you, and we're booking weddings. So, I mean, we're going to have a good summer, for yeah, sure. For sure. Um, I don't know. The thing is, do you remember when you were first starting Final Rose, how that came to be? I think I, I texted you one night, and I was yeah. like, hey, man. I know you DJ. Yeah. Like let's let's sit down and talk a little bit because maybe we could put something together. Sure. I think it was just a text. It was just a text, and uh, the reason. Do you remember how the name came to be? Because I don't know if I've ever told you this story. No, you just text me you're like it should be this, and I was like, that kind of sounds good. Yeah. Well, the reason, obviously, I mean, a lot of people think that we just use Final Rose Entertainment to carry on the whole fact that I was on The Bachelor USA yeah. briefly, right? So. Um, and to get some longevity into that, but that's not actually the case. I don't know if I ever told you no, this story. No. Well, um, you know my old roommate Dan that committed suicide. Yeah. Well, he and I had an ongoing joke, and before I'd go to bed, he'd always say, because obviously I didn't last very long in the past, right. he'd always say, he'd always yell up, don't worry, you'll always have my final rose. <laughs> so as a tribute to him and the fact that he kind of committed suicide, um, I wanted to name it Final Rose Entertainment for that purpose. Yeah, thanks. Nice. Yeah. I never knew that. Yeah. So that was the reason behind why, it, you know, I know people think that it's just, and, and I don't care like if people think. For the show. And sure. Yeah, yeah. And which I'm not denying the fact that obviously that's one thing, you know, targeting weddings, targeting love, it kind of is, you know, yeah. if you did it again, like, why not, right? Yeah. But uh, I don't know if you remember, but one of the producers from the show actually, you know, commented on the fact that we named the Final Rose Entertainment, yeah, right? Yeah, and that yeah. kind of pissed me off a little sure. bit because he didn't know, he did, in all fairness, he didn't know the the story behind it. So anyway, um, I think that it's, you know, you're a great partner to have. You've got some really inspirational stories and I thought it was important that everyone got to hear what you started at such a, such a young age. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, and, and, and I think that it's important sort of 
within that first year of marriage, you've taken on so fucking much, man. Like, That's crazy, yeah. You got married, you got a kid on the way, baby girl on the yeah. way. How much school do you have left before? Then in August. Then in August. Then that's full time. And then work. And then work on top of that. So what's what's in the deck of cards? When do you apply for, are you going to apply OPP? Or are you going to apply London? What are you thinking? I don't know. My preference is in London, man. I grew up here. I know I know people here. Yeah. I feel more comfortable back. here. You'll, you'll basically be called back to the same spot you work now on a regular <laughs> yeah. basis, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's great, buddy. Yeah. Is there anything that you want to, to anyone else to know out there? I mean, what would you, what advice would you give to anyone that maybe wants to make a difference and wants to do one of these? Whether I don't, I'm not saying they might want to break the Guinness Book of World Records, but if anybody wants to do something like going across Ontario, whether it's running, biking, or how would you recommend that they get started on that? I mean, if you have the, if you want, you know, if you want to do something, man, you can, you can pretty well do anything, you know, if you set your mind to it. And um, it's probably a lot easier now to do stuff like that, right? Yeah. But, honestly, like, if you have a goal in mind, just do it. Like, I ultimately regret not making the school decision earlier. So why didn't you make the school decision? Like, you're, how old are you now? 27. 27. So are you finding it a bit difficult to do the, yeah, yeah to go back to school at that age? Yeah, but it's, you learn more because I feel like you can, you can bring that into like real life experiences, right? That's a good point. And you're older, you're a little bit more mature, you, you understand that you're kind of there, you know, you're paying your own way, mom right. and dad aren't paying. Sure. Um, Which is it, great because you're, yeah. it's your own investment in yourself. Yeah, and at the end of the day, like you're working, you know, as a daughter and a wife and stuff like that. So ultimately, obviously, I want to be able to, you know, provide for them. Right? Sure. Yeah. Um, so you have a little bit more of a, a greater appreciation of life in general at that point. Yeah. But um, it was tough going back. Yeah, I, I honestly, I think I debated it for like four or five years. Yeah, and uh, my brother uh, told me he's like, "Call me." He said, "What do you have to lose? Like, just ultimately, this is what you always say you want to go back to and and pursue is policing. And then do it, man. Like, yeah. you have nothing to lose, right?" Well, I think ultimately you probably would have regretted it if you hadn't. If this is something that's always been weighing on you, it's a good thing you did. Yeah. Whether or not you end up as a police officer, at least you know. Yeah. There's no doubting anymore. Yeah, in my entire life, I, I there's some things that I, did, I didn't do um, growing up, and I was like, man, I should. And I feel like with life experience and maturity, like you look back and you're like, um, if you get that opportunity again to do it again, you do it, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, no, there's a lot of things that looking back, like I, I would have done a bunch of things different. But. Do you, why, why do you think that you didn't? Because for me, I know that it was my anxiety disorder that held me back and trying to figure that whole thing out was was something I had to step back from almost everything yeah. to get a handle on. So do you do you think that maybe you had some kind of uh, um, like stress or anxiety or, or even now, how do you cope with that? Like what, what do you think it was that was holding you back? I don't know what it was really. I fear? Think it was just fear, yeah. yeah. Like fear of going, I hated school, to yeah. be honest with you. And uh, I just kind of went to school because I had to go. And that was it. Do you, you know think you mean? hated it because you were forced to take things that That's you... exactly the reason. Yeah. Because you learn, like in high school, you learn stuff that, you know, you might not be interested in. Use again. Sure. Um, so I feel like it was kind of fear of, of jumping back into it. Yeah. But, like I said, being 27, you're a little bit more mature at the time. So now, um, you know, I enjoy it a lot more. And right. I, and I, uh, I grasp it a lot more. Do you feel like we kind of got ripped off? in school when we were younger and so yeah i feel like there was just i mean everyone says oh it's a tough world out there but you need your education i don't feel like that trained me for anything i think i would have been much better off learning about um you know how to become self-aware how i mean how to be more physically act how important it was to be physically active to eat healthy um all these things i mean how do you feel about that Vin chase about about living and like eating healthy and everything <laughs> okay. Fucking forget it. Well, <laughs> I mean, there's very little I can comment on, so I kind of tuned out. You know, well, you were you were homeschooled. Yeah, that's okay. why I'm bringing. So what's the question? Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, so I feel like we're talking about maybe um, you know Matt kind of didn't like school. He was he was yeah. uh, conditioned right. because he was forced to take things that he didn't. He wasn't yeah. Yeah. So that's in a homeschooling, yeah. How? Did, well, did, I mean, I was only homeschooled up until. Um, yeah. So, so did you feel when you went from homeschooling to high school that there was more 
forceful teaching, or did you feel? I know you told me you uh, felt like you had you felt like you had something to prove as like a homeschool. Well, yeah, thing. I mean, I still, I mean, there's homeschooling is obviously done differently in every household, but I mean, uh, there's the homeschoolers who you know have a schedule, and yeah. then there's the homeschoolers. It's like, oh, I homeschool, right? And it's you go, okay, you homeschool, okay. Right. Is that like taking like, an online course at your own pace? No, online? it's well. I mean, some people know how to teach, and some people say, "Oh, I'm teaching." And then there's how much teaching do you think is actually going on, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess. there's there's two sides of the coin. So my sure. my mom was a uh, geologist. Um, she's a librarian now, but she's a very smart woman. So uh, she would decide that she took it upon herself. She's like, yeah. "I'm going to teach my kids." Yeah. Um, and so she homeschooled us, but it wasn't that lax kind of schedule. It was like you had a schedule. You woke up. You looked at your things you had to do, and you did them. Right. right, and you got any shit if you didn't. What kind um, of shit did you get? Uh, you just, you know. You get spanked? You get, no, uh, <laughs> I, di I did get spanked when I was younger. Not about my mom. Yeah. It was just always a threat of, oh, well, your dad will hear about it, kind of. So, <laughs> oh, you know, it's yeah. always the threat of the it's dad, always, eh? always the threat of the dad. Oh, I'm telling your father when you come so. <laughs> yeah. Well, knowing what you do now about school, I mean, obviously you're enjoying it more because you're interested in it. Yeah. But do you ever consider homeschooling, um, you know, I don't Casey so. or. I don't, I don't think I would. No, I don't I, either. Huh, no. I don't know. I obviously it's a busy. We live busy lives, right? Yeah. So I mean, obviously, it's there for a reason. We're not bashing the education. And, system, and at the end of the day, like it's I mean, always nice to get a, a different opinion. Yeah. yeah. At the end of the day, like I think the reason my mom did it was um, because she thought she could teach better, right? Yeah. Which fair enough. I, could, I mean, it's a lot easier to teach someone one on one. Like you learn a lot more versus whether you're in a classroom with like twenty or thirty other students. Right? I agree. So I mean, you do get that advantage, but I feel like it's much more important to be on the same social level, yeah, um, yeah. And the same intellectual level. Like I can know, you know, I could. I was tested at like uh, grade uh, twelve when I went to grade nine, right? Oh wow! Yeah, like that. Yeah. Does that mean you were you like were I had to well, to go into the Ontario school system? I had to be tested, like right? they have to be like, okay, well you were homeschooled. Like, what do you actually know? You know, so you go, you go in for a standardized test. So what you um, knew was the equivalent of what a grade twelve. Yeah, was so I can't had a yeah because you know they'll they I forget it was a long time ago, but yeah. to the best of my recollection, they bring in uh, one exam and then you do that and then they're like, okay, and, and depending on how you score on that, then they like give you more difficult problems. Right. So yeah, so I was tested at a grade twelve level, um, but you know I would. Do you want to be tested at a grade twelve level, or do you want to be able to socialize at a grade twelve level, right? Because yes. there's a there's yes. a difference. There's a lack of stuff that goes on. Well, honest. the weed's definitely helping you socialize. I'll give you that right now. You're doing a great job. <laughs> but, I'm actually uh, not high right now. You're not. I'm just I'm just busting your balls, man. I wanted because you know when we talked about doing the podcast, I was like, you know, I want to try see how you are sober, see yeah. how you are stoned. I know that every. You know, lots of people smoke weed this day and age. I don't judge at all. I just like to bust balls from time to time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, it's so funny because I've got like a guy that's just you know talking about we're talking about drug use. A guy that's trained to be a cop. Yeah. <laughs> He's yeah, gonna yeah. keep his eye on you. It's <laughs> yes. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. You know what the the problem with, in my personal opinion, with weed is now is that yeah, yeah here we go. We'll yeah. get into a yeah. debate right yeah. now. You can you can wait on this too because you have the knowledge, yeah. but. Weed isn't the same as it was, you know, 20 years ago. Absolutely it's been genetically nice. altered yeah. to be way more dangerous. And I'm not saying this because I know lots of people like to smoke weed and get high. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But the levels of the THC are like, what, they used to be maybe 5%, 10%. Now they're upwards of like 90 Yeah. I mean, it was more, very it was more CBD based back in the you know, 70s. Sure. When it was, you know, hippie, hippie time. Um, but but it's more likely to be able to c contribute to mental illness now than it was back in the day. Well, yeah, and I, I think it would contribute probably, you know, obviously it, it affects you young, when you're younger differently. Well, your brain risk of schizophrenia. Sure. Um, but it, I think um, just the higher potency now probably just has the potential to contribute to mood disorders. Yeah, um, sure. Pro I agree. Probably, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's going to be people who are affected by that. Yeah. Sure, so. yeah. I, yeah, I know. I mean, you could yeah. it, it could be the thing that potentially triggers something yeah. that's underlying, though. That's right. the that's the only issue. But mm -hmm. did you learn anything about that? And like when you're when you're going through Fanshawe, you learn obviously. But you said you're focusing way more on mental health, which is a great thing. Mm -hmm. What are what are you focusing on from a drug related perspective? Do you have the debate about uh, legalizing marijuana and all that all the time? Yeah. Yeah. It's so what more and more common now, right? So what is the standpoint? Like, is there any debate against why it should be legalized? I'd like, and I'm honestly, I, I'm impartial, really, too, either yeah. way. Yeah. So I, I'm not someone that's arguing for or against. I'm not a big weed smoker. I don't. I never really have been. 
I went through a pothead phase in high school, but, uh, you know, I got so fucking, like, that, someone with anxiety disorder smoking a shitload of pot, and you're just fucking like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what am I doing, right? So, for Is me, marijuana, though, like, would you consider it a gateway to, to bigger drugs? No, I would you know, I, I think that the gateway drug is alcohol. Yeah. Al- alcohol That's what it's, a, yeah, alcohol yeah. for me has been the gateway drug to blow, to, ex- well, actually, ecstasy, I, I guess I was curious about anyway, but. Um, that th- when I was younger, it kind of went with DJing, right? You go to after parties, and sure. um, as you see now, the big EDM epidemic, it's fucking huge. People are doing tons of drugs. But uh, it was definitely, as I kind of aged, everything became, is, if I was hammered and I was drunk, I, that was the gateway to doing yeah. other shit in the after hours parties for me. If I was gonna smoke a joint, um, quite frankly, I, the only time I'll really smoke a joint is I, I Feel like sex is great when you're when you're on weed, and obviously I've been sober for 15 months. Yeah. So the one thing that I might try down the road with my girlfriend, uh, future girlfriend, if she opts for it, is just kind of you know experiencing that together. But I don't know. I still don't know, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, what do to be? Uh, I don't know. I don't know where I stand. I think I'm pretty impartial. Are you? Yeah. A lot of people talk about you know when they're sober, they don't even count weed as like a drug. It's yeah. like. Yeah, I'm still sober, but then you see the smoking and joints. It's like, okay, yeah. well, I don't know if that's kind of hypocritical or what really. I, I don't know. It's yeah. not really. I don't. I don't know. I mean, where do you draw that line, right? So anyway, um, yeah, we kind of got off on a tangent there, <laughs> but uh, I'm okay with it. So um, for Final Rose Entertainment, is there anything that you want people to know? I mean. Uh, You've obviously, we're, we're looking at doing weddings and events in the future, and did we cover everything? I mean, we didn't really cover our charity package. I think that's important to talk about. Did mm-hmm. you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, like, obviously, uh, a big part of what we wanted to do as a company was give back to our community. 100%. And, and by doing so, like, uh, you know, it, it impacts so many people, and no one else is doing that, right? That was right. kind of our thing, so... Um, yeah, we offer for charities a discounted, discounted rate our services. Yeah, very discounted. Very actually. discounted. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and uh, we will be, you will see sort of Final Rose Entertainment more and more intertwined with, I mean, we partnered up with Canadian Mental Health Association, so you'll see us at their events. Um, and, and we hope to be a part. So if anybody's listening that has a cause that they want to uh, provide entertainment and music for, we're here to help and we want you to know that. Um, but that's obviously sort of, the underlying reason I wanted to have you on, obviously we're business partners, but I really wanted your story to be to be shared as well. Yeah, for sure. So what's in, like what do you do now? This must be, this must be kind of, you, you have so many big events happening. School, going back to school at an older age. First year of marriage. Baby on the way. Are you, like, and, and fear was what held you back from going to school. Are you, do you have any fear about the future? Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously, like the thing of you know being a good dad and stuff like that. Yeah, I still that, play, that right? look at behind me. I mean, yeah. I try. And it's hard. So yeah, yeah. but I, but I mean, that comes with life experience, right? It does. And um, you know, I didn't. My dad uh, passed away when I was twelve. So uh, really, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I I didn't have much of a you know a, a father figure. Um, that was the so, same time that you got involved in Parkinson's. Yeah, and. Um, you know, but that's life experience, man. Like that—that's something that I'm going to take, and I'm going to make sure I'm there for every event for the for my daughter, and and um, it's just life, man. What yeah. did your dad pass away from? Cancer. Cancer. Yeah. Which so, is crazy because he was like a avid golfer, and you know, never smoked, never drank. Yeah. As far as I'm. Well, we've got a really powerful cancer story coming on for a woman crush Wednesday as well. Yeah. Yeah, so you have to tune in for that. For what, sure. what kind of cancer was he? Lung, it started in his lungs. And he wasn't a smoker? No. Really? And um, and it just kind of moved around from there. Hmm. Uh, I think at one point they gave him like six months to live. Yeah. And he, he fought and fought, and it was like two years later before he had passed. Huh. So, uh, so what was it that, that, uh, that kind of made you lean towards Parkinson's over, over the cancer? If, if Was it just something because... Uh, Cancer is a pretty big. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people do cancer quite frequently. You yeah, I was do... honestly, I was, I was like turned down. I brought it to um, the can- the cancer societies. So you were going to start with cancer? Yeah, that was that was because of dad, right? Yeah. Well, that's um, what, yeah. That's my curiosity here. Is yeah, and and so 
I was like, but you know what? Like, there's other people I need help. You know what I mean? Sure. There's a, there's a missing gap, and I and I had that relationship with Glenn, with who had Parkinson's. Right. And uh, noticed a gap there. Sure. And, and that's kind of why I tackled that. So you wanted, I'm feeling like this whole thing was kind of fueled because you lost your dad and you wanted to do something, and that was the other person that was kind of affecting, you had, sure. a, had an effect on your life. Yeah. Why did they turn you down? I don't know. There's so much going on. Really? At that time. There's Terry Fox run, and God, there's everything, right? It's so, uh... You know, that seems been, really, that's kind of upsetting in a way. A I mean, bit. a kid that just, a 12-year-old that just loses his dad wants yeah. to do something, and you I, turn... I wonder if I actually still have the email. Like, it'd, it'd be interesting to look back on that. Yeah. To see what I had said, because it was so long ago, right? But... Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, well, either way, you're making a difference. Yeah, people yeah. at Parkinson, I'm sure they appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate because the people of the Cancer Society that turned you down lost a really good individual mm -hmm. who could have done some, some really great things. But, you know, everything happens for a reason, and you're still doing that. So, yeah, yeah, good for sure. you. So, um, how are you coping with all of this all mentally? Of like, tell me which... Because you and I have, have had some talks. You've sure. been stressed out at times. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, I mean we all we all come to a point where we're like, holy. Yeah. And I, I blame myself because I take on too much. Too much? You know so I mean? do I, in the same way. And like going back to school, like I'm the president of student council for, for Fanshawe. Right. In Woodstock. And that was another thing that I took on. I'm like, oh my God. But, <laughs> but I wanted to because I never got to do that before. Right? Sure. And that was like I was saying, like looking back, you know, you want to try to do as much as you can. Yeah. I never did that stuff yeah. before. So I was like, why, why, why wouldn't I do this? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's tough at, sometimes, but if you prioritize certain things and you kind of make a schedule for yourself, yeah, it's, I think that's the most important thing. And I catch myself sometimes with the stuff that comes up, sometimes with you, man. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like I forgot to put Sean, <laughs> Sean in. Yeah, I and felt I'll, that I'll a little bit. I'll get that text. I'll get that text and be like, shit. Yeah. Well, I, I like to remind you that, uh, you know, you do have a partner that, that <laughs> yeah, awaits you from time to time in your busy life. But that's okay, man. I'm, I'm extremely busy, too. I just want to make sure that um, our business stays afloat because it's a really worthwhile thing to do. And yeah, it's all sure. about giving back and, uh, and having fun. Yeah. You know, it, it's kind of an outlet for, for both of us. For so sure. the more yeah, events yeah. that we can do... As you get older, and this is a thing that happens regularly, right? I mean, friends part ways because family takes priority, work takes priority, where I feel like if you have some kind of connection in the business world where you can kind of get together and be like, you know what, it's good to hang out, mm -hmm. you know, I forgot about this. Yeah. More men need that, and yeah. women too, right? But uh, I, just, I just feel like um, I look at sort of my life and I look at my, my dad's life and I look at sort of the relationships we have with other individuals and it just becomes, um, and that's part of the reason I do this podcast, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that I don't drink anymore, it's really hard for me to connect with people that I, that are still going to the bars yeah. that, I, that I still care about, right? But so this is a way where it's like, hey, why don't you come and share your story? Be on the show, let's reconnect because this conversation, it's just an act of conversation, right? I mean. No holds bar. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I didn't get to talk about was the sex positions that you and Robin <laughs> love, but you're not letting me go there. And you know, my pervy mind wants to so bad. <laughs> but uh, we won't. Mm -hmm. We won't. So, anyways, I think that's probably about time tonight. Uh, what are we at here? Is that 12:30? 12:30. Perfect. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, tune in. Thanks for. Uh, for listening today you're listening to the sex and suicide podcast this was our guest today matt granger london ontario local hero <laughs> and, and <laughs> as, al as always we've got our co-host Vinny chase here and uh really special guest coming up on wednesday for our woman crush wednesday uh michelle goldrick and uh that'll be a great um a great podcast for sure she's got a really powerful story that's uh, empowering to women and uh and anyone that's really kind of Especially even you, Matt, you've lost someone to cancer, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so tune in Wednesday. And uh, anything else we should add? That's, that's it for tonight, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for coming, and uh, we really appreciate uh, all your input on uh, mental health and motivational Monday, provided by Second Suicide Podcast. And that's <laughs> it. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll talk to you on Wednesday. Cheers.